Welcome to Muscle Research Review for the week of May the 18th, 2015. Quick research summaries for the very busy health and fitness professional. So let's begin. A new study looked at the association between anatomic location and extent of damage for an acute hamstring injury. The study looked at 275 football players with acute hamstring injury and positive findings on an MRI. Now, the findings were as follows. The long head of the biceps femoris was the most commonly affected at the proximal myotendinous junction and presents with a greater extent of edema. However, distal locations in the semitendinosus were commonly associated with greater tears. If you provide knee strengthening for rehabilitation or training, do you focus on specific vastus medialis strengthening or just general quadriceps strengthening? This seems to be a dilemma with various professionals out there. A new study looked at the effects of vastus medialis versus general quadriceps strengthening following first-time patellar dislocation. Now, the study didn't find any clinically important differences between the two groups. The drawbacks of the study was that there was substantial participation attrition rate of about 52% at 12 months. Now, what's your experience and strategy with knee strengthening? Does it change depending on the type of injury, or is there a general guideline that you follow? Let's continue with more knee-related research. Do you include myofascial trigger points in your clinical examination? A new study looked at the association between trigger points, ongoing pain, function, and sleep quality in elderly women with bilateral painful knee osteoarthritis. Now, the results were as follows. 18 women with painful osteoarthritis were matched with 18 controls. They looked for active trigger points, which would elicit referred pain that reproduced the knee symptoms. Now, the trigger points were latent if they were tender, but did not reproduce their symptoms. Women with osteoarthritis had greater number of active, but similar number of latent trigger points compared to the healthy controls. The trigger points were also associated with a higher intensity of ongoing pain. Over the years, I've found trigger points to be an important addition to the clinical exam, and addressing them has kind of led to improvements in a lot of resistant cases. However, all options and strategies should be considered. What's your strategy? Do you see better results by adding trigger point therapy? If you're interested in recovery strategies for your athlete, this next study is for you. Now, the study looked at the rate of lactate removal after maximal exercise. The study used 30 elite male rowers who performed an incremental exercise protocol on a rowing ergometer. Now, they were divided into three groups of 10 people each and about 20 minutes of the following recovery scenarios. Passive recovery active recovery at about 25% of maximal power output, and active recovery at about 50% of maximal power output. Lactate concentration decreased by 43% and 15% in the active recovery groups and increased by about 1% in the passive recovery group. Although sample size was small, there is a general trend towards a more active recovery intensity after maximal exercise. Does keyboard uh, computer keyboarding biomechanics lead to acute changes in the median nerve. The study looked at 37 healthy individuals that performed 30 and 60 minutes of typing, followed by 30 minutes of rest. They found that the cross-sectional area and swelling ratio increased after about 30 and 60 minutes and went back to baseline after 30 minutes of rest. The changes were influenced by the level of ulnar deviation. Now, the study didn't really try to link carpal tunnel injury to keyboard biomechanics, but if you put it into practice, it's important to focus on minimize ulnar deviation when typing and also understanding the importance of frequent rest breaks. Do you address the thoracic spine for your neck pain patients? If not, this study is one of the many that are seeing positive effects of this strategy. The study looked at changes in proprioception and pain in patients with neck pain after upper thoracic manipulation. 30 workers with mechanical neck pain were put into a stability training and thoracic manipulation group and in a cervical stability training only group. Now, intervention was about three times per week over about a six-week period. Results showed that the thoracic manipulation group showed a more significant difference in pain reduction. Now, both groups actually did show a reduction in pain and proprioception. One thing to note is that the study sample size was small and the length of treatments may not have been long enough to really assess the difference. However, if you've got someone with neck pain, manipulation of the thoracic spine may be warranted. 
I also tend to promote the use of thoracic self-mobilizations and mid-back exercises at home. Next time you have someone with neck and low back pain, consider addressing any functional limitations in the thoracic spine. If you have any comments, leave them below. Also make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel to stay up to date on the latest research to help your patients and clients.